welcome to another edition of Cafe de Rene. I'm your host, James Hunter, joined once again by the style of show, Mr. Rene. And Rene, who have you brought today? I've brought a long time comrade. I've known him for 20 years. He was the player coach in the famous Ohio Valley Wrestling Developmental Circuit. A uh, good friend of mine, Nick Eugene Dinsmore. Yeah, hey, hello everybody. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, James. <laughs> oh, thanks, so James. I heard, so I heard uh, post WWE, you start your own organization, Midwest All Pro Wrestling, and now it's time to hang it up. That's what's going on. Well, well, well. I, I, I'm promoting Eugene's retirement tour. Hanson oh. Jimmy, Hanson Jimmy Bay was, was on retirement tour for 15 years. He's <laughs> been on a farewell tour for 12 years. So I mean, this is just a tour. Who knows how long the tour is going to go? Somebody asked me the other day, "How long is the, is the tour going to go?" I said, "Until the last match." Right. <laughs> Holy shit. So yeah, um, where are you living now? You're still in Sioux Falls, right? Yep, in South Dakota, in Sioux Falls, best little city in America. Yeah. So um. So yeah, me and you go way back. I mean, when I first got to Louisville, Kentucky, you were you were like the player coach. Always very cool. And uh, how long? What year did you sign with the WWE? It was in '99. Yeah, late '99. It was like tail end of '99. And then I've been, finally, I've been wrestling at OVW since '96. So you've broken in '96, and that, so uh, so yeah. So you only you only got the debut about five years later with the Eugene gimmick, right? Is it two thousand four? Yeah, and um, in May maybe May of two thousand four something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, that Eugene gimmick when the yeah first bit on Raw, like he was pretty much pushed into main event programs straight away. Obviously, having the association with Eric Bischoff to begin with, I suppose it was a big rub, but. Well, I was yeah, pretty fortunate they, because I, you know, I had a character that, that the people responded to, but also had the writing team was behind it. You know, with yeah. uh, with, with Brian Gerwig's writing everything, he wrote for The Rocks. So he was writing for Eugene. That was a character he could write for. He even wrote a movie for Eugene. But then after it got really? released, they, they put Big Show in it. Yes, I remember that now. I haven't watched it, but I remember the film now. He got in, yeah. Right, it, it, it makes sense if it's Eugene, you know, being wild and crazy and. They said that they want me to wrestle a bear. And I said, well, where, where are we going to get a bear? They said, no, we'll put somebody in a bear costume. But I wanted to wrestle a bear. I, I'd have to wrestle a bear. You could not wrestle a bear. At the time, I think the only working bear was that one that was in Will Ferrell's movie where they played basketball. Uh, I don't yeah. know the name, but he, he had the bear wrestling. But it, it ended up killing his trainer, so they shot it. Whoa. <laughs> Semi-pro, I think. That's the name. There you go. Bingo. Right, right there, yeah. Yeah. Fun film. <laughs> so... A few weeks ago, we had Matt Morgan on. You know him very well. And, um, you know, he was very open and honest about uh, about addiction. And uh, now he's actually fully recovered. He's living in uh, Lakeland, Florida, and he's actually a part of, an, uh, of a group, uh, like an anti-drug group to help kids st steer away from uh, opiate addiction. Didn't he, didn't uh, he work for mayor there or something? He was the mayor. I think he had two did, terms did as a mayor. mayor. Was he mayor? Yeah, yeah, he had two terms as a mayor, and now he's a commissioner. Awesome. So, um, like I said, I haven't been in the United States for years. I left in 2007 and barely, you know, I had a few shots here and there, but very, very little. How is the, the opiate addiction situation in Sioux Falls, where you're at? Uh, I, I think it's bad in, in, in any of the, of the cities. Sioux Falls has a population of about... 180,000 people within the metropolitan city area, maybe 200,000 like as you get out, but it's not a whole lot of uh, a population. So it is there, but it's it's there's not a lot of a lot of the people to do that. So you don't see them. You, you would have to go look for them and know you know what what side of town is is the right. bad side. But you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been around the crowd, so I can't really tell you how many of them there are or where they are. But I'm I'm, I'm sure like I see the commercials here and they talk about it and you know right. The woman that was on the news, her daughter died of, uh, of the, she got the fentanyl. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Me and Matt talked about that in, in, in depth. Just, it's a, it's a, it's an epidemic. There was it's a up. bus, there was a bus in South Dakota and they found more fentanyl than every doctor in the state could legally prescribe. 
Jesus. Wow. Right. Well, it's no secret uh, for me that I, I battled with addiction. Uh, I had my own trials and tribulations, which a lot of guys, especially during the ruthless aggression, did. The ruthless aggression era. Um, do, would you mind telling us about uh, about your issues that you had that you and how you overcame them? Because, you know, a part of me doing this is not to exploit the guys. It's to basically try to reach out and tell people our stories. So hopefully we can help somebody from not going down the road or, or drag them out if they're in too deep. Yeah, I uh, I got I, I, I tore my meniscus when I was wrestling at OBW. I was wrestling Danny ba uh, Danny Basham, the damager, and I had to have a knee scope. So for six weeks, I had nothing to do, just kind of sit there and heal. So you know, every day I'd pop a few, and then it just that pattern. Once you try to come off of it after like a six week period, becomes very 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 difficult to do. Your body starts to feel. I always equated to like the panic that you feel when you think you might be starting to drown where you can't get a breath and you're underwater. And if you stick your finger in a light socket and the flu, you know, it's just this progressive nonstop vibration that just is just uncomfortable. Um, so then you take more to feed that and it just, it just became a pattern and a cycle. Right. And, um, and in Louisville, there, there were areas that, the areas where you know it was easily accessible. So mm -hmm. you know, I'd get some to take them every morning go to training at that time, it, it wasn't really a problem other than, you know, I was just a daily user. And right. I smoked pot also because the, uh, the the piss test, I don't think at the time they, they tested for for uh, uh, marijuana, I believe. And um, it just grew and grew. Then when I got on TV and I got hurt and I was on TV for maybe six, eight months, nine months. And then I blew my, my uh, uh, patella tendon, which is a very serious injury. Right. And, right. and that's one where I, I really you know I was pounding a lot to try to get back as fast as I could. Yeah. And the doctor released me to return to work after six months. Normal patella tendon shouldn't be 100% till nine months. Right. I don't know why this doctor, I watched some of my matches with Kurt Angle because when I came back, they put me in an angle with Kurt Angle. And I, just, I couldn't keep up with him. I was, I, I was like, I was hobbling on my knee. I, I was nowhere near ready to be a. Uh, uh, in, in ring with someone like Kurt Angle. So I've just tried to mask it and, and take more, more and more pain pills until it all came to a head. Manchester, England, lobby of the hotel, bars full of fans, flares in the bar, uh, Triple H is in the bar. And I went upstairs and I'd taken some somas and eaten and I was getting ready to put the tray outside my room and the door shut on me. I didn't have my key and I'm in my boxers. Oh, Jesus Christ. So I said, I'm going to have to run down there real quick. And I, I don't remember getting in the uh, elevator, but I, when I got to the lobby, I just face first planted. They, they oh, so that's... Cart, a luggage cart and, and take me to the to the awaiting ambulance. So then I woke up in, in, in a hospital in England. I had no idea, you know, where I was. Next thing I know, I'm on the phone with Johnny. Yeah, you're coming home. We're going to spend you. Uh, send you to rehab. Because that was... I'm thinking that, that was less than a week after Eddie died. Oh, yeah, we went overseas and you know international incident with you know. Yeah. One of your performers, Odin, in the middle of a hotel lobby, five star hotel lobby with fans everywhere. In his boxer shorts, yeah. So. Hopefully, you hopefully, your hopefully I was at least tan. Was that? Hopefully, I was at least tan. <laughs> So, so um, the patella tear, that was in a match. You threw a draw kick. It was with Christian, right? You threw a draw kick and then it tore? Yeah, I, I think uh, he jumped off the top with the double axe handle. And I right. was to punch him in the stomach. And I felt something, but it just might have torn partially or minorly because it, it didn't. It just kind of, ow. And then when I went for the drop kick, it just fucking completely went out. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't walk. Right, right. right. So yeah. did you go to the same real... Uh, Talbot Recovery Center in Atlanta. That's where I went, right? right. Yeah. Went. yeah. Uh, I loved it there. I, I learned so much there, and I liked it because originally I was in, they sent me to a rehab in Tennessee, and I actually got kicked out because I thought, this is bullshit. It's all a bunch of hippies, that, you know, and they sent me to Talbot, and Talbot's like they educated you and they yep. told you the science behind everything. Uh, was that enough to help you completely clean up, or did you have any uh, bumps in the road? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's a journey day today, and I I I got released. No, no, hold on. I came back, still hurting. WWE's doctor goes, uh, 
quit taking the somas, but continue to take the pain pills because you need those. So that was the green light I needed. So then I started right there again. Uh, but to get released, what had happened was uh, I moved from I moved back to Louisville from Phoenix, and uh, I found an old script that had Percocets. But I was written hydrocodone, and I took those Percocets and. I got it from a doctor, but it had been a while, and that, that's what I pissed on. I pissed on a, something I didn't have a script for. Oh. And, and and that's when I got released. That was 07. That was in 07. So I guess... It was, so, so, so get this, get this. I got it from Walgreens. Walgreens didn't keep records back that far and couldn't give me any kind of record that it was distributed to me because it was in my name. The doctor committed suicide. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. So I, 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 had no, I had no way to verify it or, or validate it, you know? I was just like, and it was, it was, that was, just, I, they didn't have the, the street three strikes then, I don't think. Right. I think it was, it was, I, I can't remember if that they started, the, they must have started the policy, but yeah, I had zero strikes at the time, unless going to rehab was two of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, those somas, man, I try to explain to people what exactly are, so they're a muscle relaxer, but you know, could you explain like exactly why the guys take them so much and why at the time they love them so much? The doctors try to say that it's non-narcotic. It might not, but it, that's what it feels like. If you take enough of them, it's it's a very almost drunkish, you know, feel good body buzz. But if you take too many, you'll get to the point where you try to just grab something and, and, and you don't have muscle control. And right. you know, literally, I've seen guys fall out of chairs and just you just you just lose muscle control. You're still conscious. Until finally you lay down, you sleep, you sleep for a little bit, sleep it off, and then you're up and you're ready to go again. Yeah. But it was a fine line. Like, you could take three of them and feel great. You could take three of them, and then you'd be out, rubber man, just falling all over the place. Right. And what they had to do with what was in your body, how hydrated you were, I, I don't know what else. But, it was, but the guys would then stack them with the, with the hydrocodone. And then that just was like another level. Like, like that was like rocket fuel. And Yeah. That's what me and Matt were talking about a few weeks ago. It's like, it's like pumping your brakes and the gas at the same time. Yeah. The, the engine, which is your heart, just explodes, right? Yeah, yeah. It was very dangerous. So you get released in 07, and you keep resting, of course. You know, you're not going to give up. And well, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize the independent market around the world. Right. When I got released. Yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do. And all of a sudden, I was booked for the next six months every weekend, making more than if I was with WWE. Right. But here's well, what happened. Right? They, they sent me to rehab. I, I got out. I didn't find out until after I got out that they charged me for it. Oh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't it know like, that. It was, it was like it was like 65 grand for, for, for nine weeks. And so oh, yeah. Like, that one in the... It was... I, actually, I think it was more. It was like seventy-five, bro. The one in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been, could have been something like that. It might have been sixty-five, five or something. But yeah. Well, you but know that. After, you know that ninety that, days you're supposed to. They started to... giving it away for free. Oh yeah, that ninety days you're supposed to get after you get released. Uh huh. I didn't get any of that. No. No, no, they took it all. Which oh. is fine. I owe it to you. It's fine. But yeah, now, now, shit. I'm thinking about going again. Give them a call. Just for going on vacation. <laughs> Get out of the house. I need a booking. <laughs> no, but let's talk about your independent career. Me and you ran, uh, we did Irish Whip together. We did a bunch yep. of shit together, right? Let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I saw that video on, I've actually posted it on my YouTube page from, from the yeah. Irish Whip Wrestling. I remember that's when Madman Manson got hit with in the face with that chain and he came back and his tooth was completely in half. He had it in his hand. Blood coming as up, but it looked so painful. I was like, oh my God. Mm. I bet it was the highlight of his career. Oh my God. Got it on that tape. Good, that was a good tour. I was a good bunch of guys. That was enjoyable. Oh yeah. It was me and PCO. We were tagging against you and uh Mandrake. You ever pop for Mandrake? Yeah. Oh, that was fun. So okay, so you did it in independence for a few years, but then you got re-signed as a coach, weren't you? A few years back? Yeah, I uh Raw was at, or one of the shows was at the Freedom Hall in Louisville. So I went over, Conway went over also, and Johnny was pitching this idea of a player coach where I could work with some guys in Florida for a little bit and then go on the road with them and wrestle them in the live events on, on or dark matches or whatnot. Um, so we started the paperwork, did all the stuff. You know, we went to uh, Pittsburgh to do the head, the, the brain testing and all that. Um, 
showed up in my first TV, and granted, I was not in very good shape, but I was expected to be in better shape than I was in, and then it just kind of, it fucked me right away, like Vince, get him out. That's the thing with Vince, man. He, if you're not, like, Here's, ripped or at least vascular. what Johnny East told me, right? Johnny East goes, Dick, we're not selling old fat Eugene. Okay, thank you. Wow. Blatantly honest, huh? No, but that's the thing, man. But that's it with Johnny. Like, you knew right away. There was, was very little bullshit. He'll tell you. You might not like what he, what he says, but at yeah. least with me, that's how I felt. Yeah. That's the thing, man. You show up and you got a gut, or you show up and you're not tan, and you show up, you can't breathe. That's it. You're gone, buddy. Yeah. Don't fuck around. James, you got anything? Yeah. Um, that was, I mean, my questions were that two, two hours. But one thing I did want to talk about, uh, Nick, and I actually watched it the other night the uh, ECW One Night Stand 06. It was the night RVD won the title, but you had a spot with uh, Sandman and like, the fans were brutal that night. They, they did not like you. So what was it like being in the uh, ECW uh, one night stand and like having that skit with Sandman and him basically going to town on you with the uh, Singapore cane? It was cool. It was like a last minute thing, honestly. It was like, I think they called me on Friday or Saturday and said, hey, you, can you make the pay-per-view? Well, of course I can. So they flew me in. Um, I, I, think, I think Brian came up with the skit, you know, just right you know, a couple of days just before it happened, but it was cool. I mean, Sam Man was cool in the entrance and, the, and there was some heat in that building. So that was fun. You know, mm. ideally I would have liked to be able to get that heat, you know, for an extended period of time and work some matches off of it, but it was what it was. But the deal was I, I still had my ring jacket on. So he's yes. hitting me with those sticks and they hurt, but they didn't get a, they didn't pinch my skin because I still had the ring jacket on. I just ducked and covered and ran. And then someone gave him another one from the crowd. He's got two of them. <laughs> back to the box room just, just wailing on me Sad man, yeah fun. I remember because I was on the fake ECW right yeah and before um, they, they were doing their own like ECW brand house shows before because they were drawing so poorly then eventually they put them with the Smackdown guys right but I remember we were working a, a match with Sad man, Dreamer against me and maybe Matt Stryker and those fans like threw water on me and shit, but it got on those fucking uh, the mats on the uh, on the floor. Yeah. And I'm walking in, getting some heat, walking, slip, boom, almost tore my fucking knee, dude. Oh. It's, all the bumps we take, it's the little things like that that get you, right? I did that one time. Somebody spilled some Mountain Dew or something around the ring, and I was coming to the ring for, for the match, entrance, high fives, slip, <laughs> bust my ass on the floor, and I get up pissed. I totally, totally no more Eugene. Who the fuck put this? <laughs> I was mad. <laughs> right? The gimmicks out, you fucking little pricks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, shit. So, yeah. So, um, so what what year did you get released the second time? It was 09? It, it was, I, I was there for a cup of coffee in 09. And then I got in released. 09. And then you start your own promotion, Midwest All Pro in, in, in Sioux City. Is that it? Uh, I hadn't started it yet. I still, I, I worked, I went back and worked a little more for OVW and did a little bit of TV writing, but uh, mainly the coaching there. Mm. Until 2013, maybe I can't remember exactly. 2013 to 2014 ish. Bill DeMott called me and they said they want me to come down to FCW and they still had FCW for a, a tryout as a coach. Okay. So FCW show, uh, shows and went there for a week and all right. So they hired me, but that was about the time that they were whatever K Fade building the, the performance center because then all of a sudden they said, okay, everybody, we got to move to Orlando. And I, I, you know, I did not move to Tampa. I moved directly to Orlando, but it was just kind of a, a, a different feeling from FCW, which seemed like a real good independent show. Right. And the Performance Center is, is a WWE product. Right. You know, it's just that, that uh, feel or tension or at least at least that's how I perceive it. Right. See, I've never i never seen the actual Performance Center, but everybody from Conway, Sly, everybody says it's like amazing. It is. Triple H, so so when Triple H trans, uh, was going from the, just in ring to going to be office work, Vince goes, uh, Terry Taylor told me this story. Vince goes, all right, Hunter, go around to each department, spend two weeks in that department, and then whenever you know you get finished, come back and report to me. So he did you know, the marketing, the advertising, whatever else they have, this and that, boom, boom, boom. He comes back, he goes, well, everything's, you know, everything has that WWE excellence, except for that developmental system. 
because realistically, it was WWE contracting with it with an indie company to, right. to put their talent, which is what they did in Louisville, which is what they did everywhere else. So Hunter said that, and Vince goes, "Great, you're going to be in charge of it." <laughs> so he went to the New York Jets training facility and saw you know exactly the kind of setup that they had, and they they got something like that. It's awesome. There's so many rings. You got the huge weight room. You got we can go up and cut promos in the confessional room, and then go back and watch it later. You can then send it to the coaches and ask them to get you know the, their response. I mean, it's, it's somebody who does not succeed in the terms of learning the business. You know, is not trying there. Not right. maybe not everybody will get over because it's hard to teach how you how to get over. But learning the basics, learning the history, you know, doing all the stuff right there, it's, it's it's all laid out. Did they have their own cafeteria too? When I was there, they did not. But I'm I'm sure uh, I went to the headquarters one time, and the cafeteria there it was it was awesome. We got to eat lunch, maybe breakfast and lunch there. So you go in, you do a short order cook. You know, I want six scrambled eggs, boom, right there. I want to, you know, a Philly cheesesteak sandwich, boom, right there, whatever you wanted. Damn. Did you work out in the gym in Titan Towers? I believe I did. Yeah, I was in there. I, I'm not, I might not have actually worked out because we might just went for a visit. But I worked out. Me and Sly worked out there. Pretty badass. It's, it's a good facility there. So, okay, so what happened uh, to the, the coaching job? What happened with that? Um... At one point, I actually, one of the talent text texted me in the middle of the night and said, hey, I don't know if this is true or not, but the rumor is that, that uh, Canyon, who was the, the office guy that, that I, I liaison with, Canyon Seaman, is going to come down tomorrow and, and you're going to get released. Okay. Huh. So talent, but, A talent told you that? Yeah, it's one of the boys because one of the guys that was in the office goes out with, with, the, with the talent and they're out drinking. He goes, oh, man, it's going to be shitty when Nick gets released tomorrow. So I just kind of waited around, and when the time came, it was, you know, he came in there, got released. He said, uh, I, I wasn't up to WWE standards. Okay, so I don't know. I'm surprised that you got released and you knew, you heard it from a talent or that one of the office workers was banging one of the talent. I don't know which one. <laughs> no shit. Damn. So this was what, uh, 2014? 2015. That was 2015. 2015. Okay. So my wife is from the Sioux Falls area. Right. So uh, I was either going to stay around Tampa, Clearwater area and start a wrestling company or come to Sioux Falls. And she wanted to come. Her family's from here. She wanted to get back home. But at the time, there was zero independent wrestling in, in, in the Sioux Falls area. You right. had to drive three hours to Omaha to see any independent live pro wrestling. Right. So you know, we, we really started a, started a company here, started a brand, wrestled around, you know, had, had a slight little territory. So it was a good run. It was fun. So did you just one run? You ran one city, or did you do several? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we did the whole area. We go, uh, of, I think three hours north is Fargo. We went four hours west is uh, uh, Rapid City. Hour south to Sioux City. We went there. We went, went all the way to Hardwick, Minnesota. Nice. Up and down, town to town. You know, you know the drill. <laughs> Awesome. So now uh, you've had your run as a promoter, and now it's time to uh, go on one of the many, many retirement tours. I think I'm just going to stay on retirement tour. That's a whole gimmick. <laughs> you know, this might be the last chance for you to buy this 8 by 10 young man. Right? This might be the last time I'm at a show. This might be the last chance to make a memory. You, you, you can't pass up that. Chance of a lifetime, right here and now, until I come next time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Desmond, you broke so many. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Dismore, you broke some of your records. Might I well try to break Terry Funk's record, right? For the most retirement. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. Just keep retiring oh. and just keep wrestling. So, with that being said, where's your first stop? When's it start? Oh, man. I'm, I, I, the whole time I was uh, doing Midwest All Pro Wrestling, I was still accepting bookings on, on my off days as Eugene. So, yeah. you know, now that I'm pushing the retirement tour, I, I booked up a couple. I mean, it's, it's starting to fill up. I can't ever remember anything off the top of my head. I got it all written down. So I got a bunch of good towns I'm coming to. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tweet it out here soon. Right. Well, let me uh, let me make some calls. Maybe we'll get you up to Canada. I don't know what the situation is with the goddamn Corona. Yeah. But I think I think you can come up here to Canada, right? I, I don't know. I know Vampiro came to the states and got back recently. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. 
Right. So do you keep in touch with any of the boys from OBW, like Rip or anybody? Yeah, I, I, I'll randomly text Rip or I'll randomly get a text back and forth, up and down. Um, every now and then, I, I will text Cena. If, if I see him on the cover of something and think he looks good, you know, just I don't want to keep fucking texting him. I'll text him and he'll, he'll thank me or whatnot. Yeah. Um, Jeter started a pro wrestling training center in Southern California. I can't remember where he is. Maybe a, a San Diego, maybe, I think. I thought it was in Arizona. Maybe it is. Yeah, yeah. I, that's right. It's in Arizona. I, I forgot. But he, he had called me beforehand and kind of, you know, asked some questions. And I gave him, you know, some, some pointers and things that work for me. And he, he seems to be doing well. It looks exciting. Oh. Yeah, we're, I'm looking forward to having him on the show. We talk to each other. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. So, so. Oh, got injured, took hmm? the gimmicks, got hooked up with gimmicks, went to rehab, came back. WWE doctor says start taking the gimmicks again. So I start taking them again, and then when I'm when I'm off, then I'm, I'm still addicted to the the, the the opiates, but I can't. Uh, I don't have a job, so that's when I got on Suboxone. And that's really uh, when I got off of it. Was like uh, after after oh nine or no after oh seven when I really a little bit after that. My wife found a Suboxone doctor, and I went there. And, over however long it took three months or so he just progressively cut me down and it, it worked, worked like a charm it, it worked like a charm yeah a lot of people get on that suboxone to, but the uh, thing is is you're gonna get yourself addicted to suboxone but it's easier to taper down because it does not give you a, a euphoric feeling yeah a few years back i had fell back into the into the into the trap and they wanted to put me on methadone and i said no freaking way am i gonna on that shit i don't know a whole lot of, of people that have taken it but the, the small amount that i had said it's harder to come off of methadone than it is to come off of heroin right the, i don't know if i don't know if i don't know heroin but I, they said you know well, heroin is all natural where uh, uh, methadone is, is highly chemical and it just takes a longer time for your body to, to get off of it but i take i take kratom now have you taken kratom I tried Kratom. I had a friend of mine out in Alberta gave it to me for the, and I guess that helps a lot of people get off the opiates. I, absolutely. It's all natural and you have to take a number of, of pills or powder or whatnot, but yeah. it, it, it works just yeah. as good as Suboxone, I think. I still take that now just to try to, because it is also a, a painkiller, like, like a Tylenol, not, not a euphoric, but a, a makes you feel better. Yeah, no, no, it, it doesn't last long, maybe 15, 20 minutes, right? Yeah, it's good. I mean, it, it depends on you know, how much you take and then how much you take. How yeah, because, you because, no, it's like the reason why I like talking about this is because the, the, the opioid epidemic in North America is out of control. Um, and that's why I like bringing guys on here to just tell their story and what helped them get off and to motivate kids to just never try the shit. The doctor prescribed you something. See, can I take Advil instead? Do I really need this? You know, because it's uh, yeah, it's, 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 diff it's difficult because I don't think people realize how quickly your body can become uh, dependent on a substance. When, when, when people say addiction, sometimes they think of the worst of the worst scenario that has happened to a person that's been struggling for a long time. But your body could get addicted in like nine days. You know, seven to ten days. On, on, on seven to ten days. You, you don't start doing the behaviors that make people live go down the tubes yet, but your body's saying, okay, um, I equate it to like eating or drinking, that we have to have that. And if you don't have it, you're going to have a physical response. And that's the exact same thing. It changes our brain chemistry to say, you need this, like like your life depends on it. So if you don't have it, it's it's like you're in like sheer panic and it's just this miserable feeling. Oh, I was telling um. Did you ever uh, go through a withdrawal symptoms where you, you puke and, and diarrhea and all that stuff? Did you ever go through that? I, I never vomited, but yeah, I would, I would, I couldn't, eat, I couldn't eat anything. And I just right. diarrhea nonstop for for seven to ten days. Oh, gee! And the longer you're on it, the longer the withdrawal will last. Yes, yes. And it is. Oh, it's the worst, the worst, the worst. Picture the worst flu times a hundred, man. It's yeah, it's brutal. difficult to explain. And, and the whole time, every, there's something in your brain. Well, maybe I should just go, go take one more. You know, just one more will be okay. Your brain's constantly telling you things like this, trying yeah. to reassure you back into the addiction. But it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I came off cold turkey one hard time, and, and I was I was a bear to be around for for seven to eight days or more, maybe. Yeah. 
it's still even after that, it takes a long time for, for, for your body to recover. Yep. Well, it's like when Matt Morgan told me he was on it for five straight years. I never knew. Yeah. I couldn't tell. I just always saw him jo- whacked up and jo- I saw, well, that's just Matt. That's just, you know, he's a, an athlete, he's a jock, and that's just the way he is. Mm-hmm. But it turns out he was high, high amounts. He was on 40 to 60, uh, 40 to, no, 60 to 100 milligrams every four hours. Nonstop. I couldn't believe it. That's the thing. You never know, right? A lot, man. Yeah, it, 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 especially when, when, when the addiction starts to get worse, then people have secret lives. You know, mm-hmm. they, they live this life where they have to maintain their, their, their drug addiction, but yet on the outside, nobody knows and everything looks great. They're functioning addicts, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it can take one, one thing to just make that functioning go to, you just ruined your life. You know, it could be one little instance and just every, the house of cards can fall down. Right. It's like our good friend, um, Rod Steele. The real deal, yeah. Rod Steele. The real deal, Rod Steele. Eventually, he just, uh, he called it quits, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he took his own life, but he was up and down. And I, I don't know deeply into his story because... Rod Steele was like an enigma and just, you know, everything we talked about was kind of what was going on now in wrestling. Yeah. But I know he, he had some struggles. And I think, uh, I think as, as Rod told me one time, lawyers dealing with it now. <laughs> yes. For the fans who don't know, Rod Steele was a local Kentucky wrestler who was infamous in the uh, OVW, got over like a million bucks, got over with the boys more importantly. And yeah. unfortunately, uh, what was this, Ten years ago, I don't think it was that long ago, but it's been a while. It, it very well could have been. I, I might be wrong. The, the yeah. past fifteen years have kind of smooshed together, so. Right. Yeah. He he uh, sadly took his own life, like a lot of our fellow wrestling comrades have. In the, yeah. In the past I watched years. the video. I watched the video the other day. It said wrestler deaths from two thousand twenty one, and it really wasn't that long of a video. It's the right. first time it wasn't like, you know, a, a, there were some sad ones and there was people that probably shouldn't have. I mean, I, it breaks my heart that, that Daphne passed yeah. away from addiction, but it was it was a smaller video, which, you know, kind of made me feel, well, maybe we're getting out of that, of that stage. Those guys that were in wrestling at that time from the 80s to the mid-90s, 2000s, but once once it would be, uh, uh, did that wellness policy, it, it cleaned up the locker room from that type stuff fairly quickly there might have been guys that could sneak it around but it wasn't uh it wasn't the baby rattle you would hear and everybody would turn their head hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah definitely no it's great i mean uh, they are top dogs so whatever they do they influence everybody especially in north america you know so uh, i'm glad that they they did they do that because you know they're, they're the leader of the pack you know like a lot, of, uh, a lot of today's wrestlers as well, um, they're not into drinking and partying. We've mentioned it, Renee. A lot of the today's wrestlers just like playing video games. Yeah, yeah. Or, or well, it, stuff it doesn't involve, you know, some kind of vice, which I think is awesome. Right. I mean, um, whatever, whatever are works. You, are you surprised? Obviously, like back in your day, there was a lot. The road school uh, road schedule was a lot more hectic, especially. Looking at the 80s and the 90s, I've read, I've told Renee many times, read Britta Hart's book and that road schedule, they called it the killer tour. It was unreal, but it's been mentioned for years and Jesse Fentoro is the one person that always tried to do it. Are you surprised that there still isn't a wrestler's union or doesn't it surprise the fact there isn't still? There hasn't been enough guys band together and not try a lawsuit, go, go straight to the government somehow and say, listen, mm. you know, we're performers. I don't know if the animals at, at, at SeaWorld are in some kind of union, but I would imagine there would have to be some kind of union for those performing animals in SeaWorld. And WWE yeah. is making a big chunk of money in Florida and aren't requiring their talent that's going to make them money on TV, uh, the, not allowing a, a union. Because, I mean, if somebody else was on every Monday night at, at prime time time for four years, they would be in an actor's union, get their health care and, and stuff like that. So it's really... It's really at a disadvantage, but because there's well, there's AW now, and if AW started doing it, that might even be able to influence them. Because then, if somebody says, "Hey, I gotta have this in my contract," if they want them bad enough, they'll bend. But I, th- I think they're trying to hold out because I mean, Vince is a billionaire, 
And this company, yeah. you know, they're bragging about, you know, their, their quarterly uh, um, earnings are up and all, all these brags that are seen on, like, you know, the, the news channels that talk about uh, business and money. And it's, uh, I feel like there should be, you know, just the, but then, then again, who would be included in, like, are you, are you going to retroactive? You know, are you going to have to cover guys or, or give benefits to guys that, that, or is it just we start now? Yeah. Yeah. I think AEW, when they first came about, one of their big promises was to give wrestlers health insurance, and it has not been mentioned since. <laughs> yeah. It's one so thing like, to say it. Well, like, exactly. like, like, WWE is this also. WWE is, is a variety show that should have enough money from a television show, two television shows on, on prime time, to be able to give health care, at least to their performers. Mm-hmm. Going full blown into a union where there's a lot of other things involved, maybe that not be, but that might not be the the ledge they want to get close to. But they should be able to give them some kind of health health care while they're there. Seeing as we're working almost every day for them. Yeah, I have I have heard stories though, like uh, when you're in Vince's inner circle, he'll go above and beyond. Like I've heard of him fucking sending his private jet to go pick up some of his inner circle when they were on. To get him help. Send Look him at Razor. Help. Huh? Look at Razor. Look at Razor, the amount of times yeah. they've sent him. Well, no, no, I'm not talking just rehab. I'm talking like... Anything, uh, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah, I was, yeah. So, uh, uh, Cena was booked in his hometown. There was a benefit show for, I think, someone had passed away, got hit by a car, and they were doing this big benefit to put everything together, and they allowed Cena to come in, and he was going to referee the main event. And... Uh, he was working, I think, Edge at the time. So he, me and him chit chat in the car about what he should do in the match as a referee. And we kind of put it all together. So I'm watching on the screen back there. Okay, he does this, he does this. I knew everything he was going to do. And all of a sudden, somebody gets in the ring do, doing the strut. You know, this is, it's just, I think, Triton High School, like somewhere in, in uh, up in the Northeast in the Boston area. And I said, they got a Vince impersonator. Oh my God, that's great. <laughs> Cena turns around, picks him up, gives him his finish, and the guy runs off. It was Vince. <laughs> but Vince showed up at an indie show and, and, t- and took, t- took Cena's move and then just left. The crowd didn't bleep. Like, they got quiet. They were like, they had no idea what was going on. And, and, and it was just a funny thing. I didn't see him before. I didn't see him after. Right. Yeah. What's some of your favorite interactions with uh, Mr. McMahon or Vince McMahon there, uh, Nick? <laughs> I, I I was always intimidated by him, so the work I had to do, I kind of kept my mouth shut and my ears open and just did my best. But when I had my knee surgery and I went to Birmingham and I was doing therapy in Birmingham, that's when he blew out both his knees in that Royal Rumble when he was getting in. Awesome. So I knew when he had surgery because it was on the dirt sheet, but then I knew where the hospital was. So I just went in and asked, asked them what room he was in. They told me, so I, I creeped in there. Nobody was around, and he hadn't he hadn't shaved in a couple of days, right? I mean, he's got like 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 a, like a five like two day shadow, and I could tell he was me like oh, oh hello, and I just I said hey you know I'm just in town. I knew he had somebody there that could do something. I said if you need me to run any errands or do anything, I'm I'm here for you. And I was so nervous, and I left. I sh- I should have sat a chair down next to him and made and talked his head off until he made me leave. You know, I should have just right. picked his brain like like the mark that I am and just talk wrestling and whatnot until he said no, I need you to leave and just. So see what happened, right? That's, that's, that's one thing I really regret. I didn't, I didn't take that opportunity because he ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> was that women just said, "Okay, now this is how you make me the world champion." <laughs> you should have grabbed the hammer and said, "Listen, old man, you want to walk again? <laughs> Renegotiate my contract." <laughs> oh shit! I'm just joking. Anyway, so other than that, Nick, retirement tour 222. That's when it begins, yes. That's where it begins. When it ends, yeah, who it's knows? Gonna, it's going to go until the last match. <laughs> well, that's it. So all, for all our fans listening, uh, this might be your last chance to see the one, the only, Nick, the man with the golden dick. Dick. The man with the golden dick. Dr. Cock and Balls. That Kenny Powers. Dinsmore, coming to a small town near you. If for more listening to this, you got to book him. Let's, uh, let's give him your details there, Nick. Uh, I'm on Twitter at U-G-E-N-E, Dinsmore, D-I-N-S-M-O-R-E. All the uh, bookings for the tour go to uh, UGNickDinsmore at gmail.com. Uh, okay. Yep. James? 
Yeah, uh, I always do it every week. Uh, final question <laughs> from myself. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you was getting a big push straight away with the Eugene character. So I'll have to ask, obviously, they positioned you in Evolution, and it was a fun storyline that culminated, <clears throat> I suppose, in the big match at SummerSlam with Triple H. Uh, what was Triple H's reaction, knowing fact you was going to be facing them at SummerSlam? I, I don't know for sure because I didn't I wasn't like buddy, buddy buddy with him, but we were working together, so we talked a lot and he told me a lot. I, as someone had said, and I don't I don't know if it's true, he, he didn't feel like Eugene was probably the right guy that he should have wrestled at SummerSlam. But Vince was like, No, this is this is the blow off. You know, he, he you know, we need we need a pinnacle to hear. I don't know, but Triple H definitely I think had fun with it because all of a sudden he's got a guy who can work a different character. And they could write it out and write it for so long. And just that, it, it was awesome. And just that slow turn where Eugene wasn't sure you know, who, who to trust, Regal or, or Triple H. But when we wrestled the blow-off match, it was, in, uh, it was in Toronto, right? And they turned, yeah. the whole crowd turned on me. The whole crowd just booed yeah. the shit out of me and cheered Hunter. And I, I, I wanted so bad to just get some heat on him. You know, give him a big comeback, but he, he wouldn't, you know, he, he wouldn't have our match and he's the general. So I, I did it, but it came off great. It was fantastic. I was lucky enough, you know, to work with Triple H in the main event of SummerSlam. A main event. That's right. Yeah. It was damn Canadians, man. Fuck. Bunch of arseholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, absolute pleasure speaking to you, Nick. Uh, Renee, once again, uh, speaking to you as always. And yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. And thank you for all the great support. Again, lately, numbers have been skyrocketing. So we're very thankful. If you want to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at Cafe de Renee. Uh, please hit the subscribe button, share with everyone. And if you want to follow me, even uh, follow me at Primetime Conversations, where you can check out many other interviews. Uh, Renee, I'll leave you with the leaving remarks. Well, Nick, just wanted to say it's been 20 years, and uh, you've always been a great guy, always helpful, and uh, glad to call you a friend, and I'm going to uh, congratulate you on your your <laughs> your retirement tour, the never-ending <laughs> retirement tour. <laughs> it's going to have to come up to Canada at some point. We're going to come up to Canada. We're going to talk to some promoters up here. We're going to get you, and I want to have a Renee Dupree Eugene match so we can do a bunch of magic spots, okay? We can the whole loop. That's it. We're doing the loop, baby. Fire it up. <laughs> but thank so you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you, Nick. We'll talk soon, okay? All right. Thank you. Bye bye.